There are some systems in Ashes of Creation that have a chance to be the best we have ever seen in an MMO. Certainly the weather and season systems and the character creator we saw this year are in that conversation. I think the artisan system is also in that conversation. Combat and PvE are a couple of examples of systems that I am very skeptical of whether or not they have a chance to be the best we have ever seen in an MMO. But the open world PvP is a system that I think does have a very strong chance to be the best ever and not in a way that prohibits PvE-focused players from enjoying this game as well. And this is the reason I put Ashes of Creation at the top of my most anticipated upcoming MMOs, because I love PvP and MMOs. I like both open world and arena PvP. Now I don't think Ashes will have a great arena PvP system, but I do think the open world could be great. And we truly haven't seen a great open world PvP MMO in forever. Arc Age was good very early on, but quickly died out, mostly from terrible monetization choices. Guild Wars 2 and The Elder Scrolls Online both had a form of Dark Age of Camelot's open world PvP. PvP, but both were too shallow and both seemed tacked on, not a core element of the game. Now, this video is not meant to be a video that explains the PvP systems in depth. I plan to do that in my Ashes of Creation Crash Course videos, but for the uninitiated, I'm going to give a brief rundown of these systems and why I think these systems could be perfect for those that love open world PvP, while also being friendly to those that are more focused on PvE. It is worth noting that PvP is always on in Ashes with very minimal safe zones. The only safe zones are freeholds and player run stalls. This sounds intimidating to PvE focused players, but it really should not be once you understand the corruption system. There are three schools of thought regarding Ashes of Creation's PvP that people tend to fall into. Those that fall into the camp of Ashes of Creation will be a gank box and completely unfriendly to PvE only players. Then you have those that think the corruption system, which is Ashes of Creation's flagging system, will be too restrictive and cause open world PvP outside of the non corruption enabled systems such as caravans to not exist. Then there is the third camp, which I fall into, which thinks the corruption system is a very well designed system that will allow plenty of organic open world PvP. PvP, while being heavily penalizing and severely reducing the amount of pointless ganking of PvE focused players. In other words, it will allow both PvP and PvE players to be happy while also having the threat of PvP being present at all times. Before explaining why I think that, a brief explanation of the corruption system is in order. There are three flagging states in Ashes of Creation, non-combatant, which is the default state, combatant, and corrupted. These different states greatly affect your death penalty. The standard penalty for those flagged as a non-combatant is as follows. Experience debt. Not XP loss, but a debt you have to burn off before your character will gain XP again. Skill and stat dampening. Lower health and mana. Lower gear proficiency. Reduction in drop rates from monsters. Durability loss on your gear, which includes both a gold cost and a material cost. Dropping a percentage of your gatherables and process goods, which includes the certificates from mob kills and certificates players will later get from caravan PvP. If the player is using a mule that also has an inventory, that can also be killed and will also drop the same percentage of lootable goods and materials as the player. The standard death penalty does not include the dropping of finished items, whether worn or not. Now, while this sounds severe, we don't know the numbers behind any of this yet, so it could be really harsh or not that harsh, we don't know yet. But why this matters for PvP is combatants get a 50% reduction on this death penalty, and corrupted get a 400% increase to this death penalty. Corrupted also get some additional effects on death, like a chance to drop items. Now, as far as how someone gets flagged into these states, this image shows all the possible combinations. Feel free to pause if you want, but I will walk through a quick scenario. Imagine I'm out in the woods harvesting some lumber next to our favorite forest person, Framine, who is trying to explain to me why becoming one with the forest will make me a better gatherer of wood. I happily harvest away while he explains this to me, but during this someone decides to attack me. This person is therefore flagged as a combatant. I choose not to fight back and he kills me, and I get the non-combatant death penalty and he becomes corrupted. Depending on the level disparity between me and him determines how much corruption he gets, and the more times he kills non-combatants, the more the corruption stacks. But that scenario is not realistic because of course I would fight back, and of course I would win. Fighting back means I get flagged as a combatant, and when I win the fight, I do not get corrupted as I killed a combatant, not a non-combatant. I can then loot his corpse, which again would be subject to 50% of the standard death penalty. So with that out of the way, why do I think that PvP 
players will be very happy with this system. I think this because if a PvP focused player attacks another PvP focused player, most likely that player is going to be incentivized to fight back. A PvP focused player that gets attacked likes to PvP, so they will often engage in PvP when given the chance. It also reduces their death penalty, and if they kill their attacker, they get to loot what they drop and do not become corrupted. So organic, open world PvP I think will be plentiful for those that are into that. Why do I think the system will also allow PvE players to play the game and not get needlessly killed over and over? Because the penalty for corruption is so severe that most PvPers will avoid it at all costs. And even if a player does kill a player that never fights back, repeated killing of that same player becomes much harder. First of all, now the PvPer is corrupted and he will be much less effective in combat. Second, the PvEer can now fight back without any penalty and in fact with the benefit of becoming a combatant and reducing their penalty, or they can still choose to not flag and let the corrupted player kill them again. This will give this player even more corruption, and very quickly this corrupted player will be completely ineffective in combat. On top of this, all other players in the area are incentivized to kill this player as the risk-reward ratio is incredible, because if you die, you die as a combatant, with reduced death penalty. But if you win, and the odds of you winning should be decent because of the corrupt player being less powerful than before, you then have a chance to loot items from the corrupt player, as corrupt players on death have a chance to drop items in addition to the 400% increase in in material drops. This is the only time a player can drop items, so many people will be wanting to kill this guy. On top of that, there is a bounty hunter system that will be available to citizens of military nodes that will allow players to see the locations of corrupted players and get quests to kill them. So I really think PvE players, once they understand the system, will come to realize that unwanted PvP will not happen as often as they think it will, and that it will likely not be a gank box. I also suspect that there will be some servers that have a higher ratio of PvE players than others. There are no official PvE servers, but I suspect there might be some unofficial PvE servers organized by the community. Further proof it will likely not be a gank box is that this corruption system is basically a direct copy of Lineage 2, and that game was not a gank box. There are going to be some areas of the world that will have more PvP than normal. Natural conflict will occur due to the nature of the map and how materials, mob spawns, and bosses are dispersed through the world. For example, some of the gathering materials will be scarce in most of the world world and more abundant in certain areas of the world. This will create a lot of open world PvP situations as those areas could be heavily contested. Non-PvP oriented players might even be incentivized to fight back simply to avoid the normal death penalty and get half the death penalty if they are carrying a lot of valuable materials. PvP oriented players in these areas might even be willing to risk getting corruption in order to secure these materials. And those that are PvP focused will absolutely be flagging as a combatant and going to battle frequently. These zones will reinforce the idea that this MMO will be much better played with friends and guilds than it will be as a solo player. It's not that being solo will be impossible, it just will be much more difficult than in a lot of modern MMOs, especially in hotly contested areas. Then those materials once gathered will need to be transported. Players have limited inventory and crafting and node advancement is going to take a lot of materials, so players can acquire mules that can transport 10 times more materials than a player. These will probably be useful while gathering and hauling the gathered materials back to the nearest node, but for moving these materials to your home home node or wherever they are needed, you will be highly incentivized to utilize the caravan system as they carry 10 times more than a mule can. Which brings us to the objective based PvP systems such as caravans. At this point the open world PvP system looks pretty solid, but then for the PvP hungry players there are all sorts of other systems that we can add on top of this that potentially push it to be the best ever. There are objective based systems that do not use the corruption system and do not have death penalties which includes caravans, guild wars, node wars, node sieges, castle sieges, naval pvp, and arenas. Caravan attackers do have a death penalty of gear degradation, but not the other death penalties. The politics between nodes, guilds, and castle kings and queens should provide ample opportunities for pvp in this game. The affiliation tree is an interesting mechanic that could even pit guild members against each other in node wars. Node affiliation is at the top of the tree, so if guild members are members of two nodes that are at war, then those guild members will be at war. So not only do you have the normal guild versus guild politics, you now have node versus node politics and plenty of potential for more politics than normal within your own guild. Now as for the sieges, 
There are some that don't think sieges will happen that often in Ashes, especially node sieges. Castle sieges I think will be plentiful. Now castle sieges can only happen once a month, but I suspect you will probably see a new siege most months on most of the castles on servers with a healthy population. Castles provide a ton of benefits to the guild that owns it. A few examples are flying mounts for the king or queen of the castle, taxes, some of which are used to upgrade the castle but some that can be used by the guild for whatever they want, and special events and special node buildings that can be locked, and there are many more perks as well. So the incentive for a guild to own a castle will be huge, so I suspect castle sieges will not be rare. But what about node sieges? It's hard to say on this one until we get into testing. I think one of the big areas of contention between nodes might be between parent nodes and their vassal nodes. And all it takes for a node to become a vassal is an adjacent node to hit stage 3, the village stage, which will be achieved within a few days. Then the vassal node is forever locked down from advancing by their parent node and will always be at least one stage lower than their parent node. Any excess experience then goes to the parent node. Vassal also has to pay taxes to the parent node, so I could see a lot of natural conflict happening between vassal nodes and parent nodes organically. Vassal nodes cannot declare war on their parent node, but there is nothing stopping a resident of that node from declaring a siege on the parent node. Siege declarations are not done by guilds, nodes, or any organization. They are done by individuals, and the only limitation placed on who can get that scroll is that they are not a citizen of that node. Siege declaration scrolls are not going to be cheap and will get more expensive the higher the node level is, but the lack of restrictions on who can siege a node means sieging nodes will probably be pretty Pretty common early in a server's life, especially stage 3 and 4 nodes, since they are the lower tier parent nodes are not as expensive to siege, and the chances of the attacker winning are much greater than the stage 5 and 6 nodes. The reason for this is, the higher the node stage, the better the defender advantage gets. Defenders do have to purchase all the available defenses just as attackers have to purchase all the siege equipment they want to use. But the defender in a node siege has an advantage that scales with the node level. On top of that, the siege declaration time is longer for the higher tier nodes, and the cooldown for an unsuccessful siege is longer. So for example, a max level node or metropolis has a 5 day declaration timer and a 50 day cooldown before it can be sieged again after an unsuccessful siege. So I think once nodes hit stage 5 and 6 it is quite possible that successful sieges become pretty rare, which means due to the cost of sieging them players might naturally avoid attempting it after a few failed attempts. So I could see later on in a server's life when there are 5 metropolis nodes on the server, node sieges being more rare than they were early in the server's life, at least on the higher tier nodes. Sieging lower tier nodes might not give many benefits when it will be a vassal under a stage 6 node no matter what. It might let your node advance a few more levels at best. Sieging vassal nodes could be a way to weaken a metropolis before you siege it I suppose, so maybe that is a valid tactic that players could use to successfully siege a metropolis. Destroy its vassal nodes first, then go after the metropolis after you have starved it of tax income. But again, I am completely unsure. I'm just theory crafting and basing this on what we currently know. Again, I think there will probably be no shortage of reasons to want to siege a node. The metropolis node type might not be your favorite node type. You might want to siege it to unlock some other content locked behind another node developing. You might not like the mayor or guilds that live there, but the defender advantage and the cost involved might be prohibitive to sieges occurring later in the server's life, or at least successful sieges. But that is what alpha testing is for. Intrepid can adjust to find the right balance. Constant sieges might not be fun either. And even if node siege balance comes in on the side of not a lot of sieges, there are so many other PvP avenues that it shouldn't limit the amount of PvP that happens. The best part of the PvP in this MMO is that it is deeply interwoven with all the core systems of this game. It is not a tacked on feature that has no risk to reward dynamics. It has a dynamic, highly thought out flagging system that will encourage open PvP for those that want it, but in most cases it will not be worth it for a PvPer to kill someone that does not fight back and get corruption. There are some exceptions, most notably when the PvE player has a lot of valuable materials in their possession, but in most cases PvE players can coexist and do just fine in this game. So the PvP has a ton of incentive and risk to reward. On top of that there are also leaderboards and PvP seasons. 
season, the dungeon and raid leaderboards could encourage PvP from those that want to move up in those rankings. PvP seasons last six months and track a player's performance in the caravan system, arenas, and wars. Players at the end of the season will get gear enhancement rewards, achievements, and currency. There's even a guild ladder that will rank guilds on their performance in guild ward sieges and world bosses. Again, this competition to get to the top of the leaderboard will be yet another draw to get people participating in these systems. So far, I've only outlined why I think this system could be the best open world PvP we have ever seen in an MMO. And I do think this game has a great chance to be just that. But what are some things that could go wrong that could cause that to not be the case? Well, the combat could be bad, which with the hybrid system and the direction they are taking, that is a possibility. And balancing some players being heavily tab and some being heavily action could be a huge problem. And on top of that, the combat could be good, but classic balance could be terrible, which this game technically only has eight classes that are highly customizable, not 64 classes. So it should be possible to balance them, especially since they are using rock, paper, scissors, balance and balancing based on an eight man group size. But sometimes rock, paper, scissors balancing is used as an excuse to have terrible balance. And with the high degree of customizability that they're going for with the many different augment systems, with the hybrid system and with the talent system that is going to let some players choose to have a lot of skills and others have few skills that are heavily buffed, there are a lot of opportunities for poor balance. Another potential problem is gear disparity. The highest tier gear will give you an approximately 40 to 50% power increase at max level. Now I'm not sure if that power increase is over your base stats or if it is the lowest tier level 50 gear set versus the highest tier level 50 gear set. There's a huge difference between the two. If it is the latter and the 50% power increase is over the tier one level 50 gear, then the gear disparity could be huge a year or two after release. And that could also be very detrimental to PVP. We know that achieving things in Ashes will be a major accomplishment, so getting the max tier gear will take a long time, which I am okay with. But if the disparity is so extreme in addition to the long time required to achieve the gear, that can and has been a problem in other PvP MMOs in the past. Another issue could be if PvP activities give drastically lower XP and rewards versus PvE the artisan system, and other game activities. I suspect this will not be the case, but it's something to watch, and it is something we have seen in a lot of MMOs as well. Like a lot of my videos, this one started as what I thought was a very simple idea and became something much bigger the more I thought about it and reread the same wiki pages for the 18th time. My longer videos rarely do well, but I didn't know of a great way to break this one apart, so it remains long. So if you liked the video, don't forget to subscribe, and with that, I will see you in the next video.